I am asking the Holy Ghost to hand deliver this word into your spirit today. Hallelujah. So watch out. It may feel a little bit different than how we usually do things. We usually just put stuff out and you can pick it up or you cannot pick it up. But I am asking the Holy Ghost to stand in front of you and to impart his word into your spirit today. The only way that you won't receive is if you sit there with the Holy Ghost right in front of you, ready to impart his word and say, no, thank you. I'm good. Yeah. All right, so you, you didn't know what you were getting into today. But I'm serious about the Word of God today. I'm not playing. I did not come to go through the motions. This is the midnight hour. It is uh, the time that we had better get busy working for God. It is the time that we had better get serious about serving God and watching for His return. How many know Jesus said, you better watch and pray? Hallelujah. I'm going to start with Matthew, the 22nd chapter in the 14th verse. Very, very familiar uh, passage to everybody in this church and anybody that's uh, watched our messages online. It says this. Jesus very simply uh, was teaching and said, for many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. You know, that might be one of the easiest memory verses that I've ever seen, aside from Jesus wept. And, uh, and so you might want to commit that to memory. For many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus was in this very simple and very uh, short passage, was laying out one of the most fundamentally transformational pieces of truth that would lead his people into the revelations of the kingdom of God. You see, it doesn't come about that you get saved and then all of a sudden everybody just gets all the same from God. No, he said that I will save anybody who believes and calls upon my name. But then in Matthew 6 and 33, a funny thing happens. He said, but then after salvation, then you're going to have to seek first that means put aside everything else onto a lower plane of priority and you're going to if you really want for me to be a, a real presence in your life and to go beyond the shallows of salvation then now the onus is on you to begin to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and he said then all the other stuff that you think is so important your your food your your provision your place to live the clothes on your back he said if you will simply make a determination uh, that you're going to seek first uh, after my kingdom you're not going to have to th even think about any of the, the other things uh, because all these other things uh, are going to be added unto you uh, can somebody that can testify that that's the truth just lift your hand right now uh, that you're a testimony he's jehovah jireh the provider Hallelujah. And so Jesus wanted us to understand uh, that there are many who are called. Uh, I want to be very, very specific uh, that the calling uh, has been put out to everybody, whosoever will. Uh, just as salvation is for whosoever will, uh, the calling uh, to walk close to the bridegroom, uh, the calling uh, to be in the bride of Christ, uh, it is placed out uh, to the masses. Uh, if you know Jesus, uh, the opportunity to be in his bride is extended to you. Amen. Because why? Many are called. Many are called. But then he said very, uh, very importantly that few are chosen. Why is it that fact that few would be chosen when many were called? What is wrong with the many? What is wrong with the brains of the many? When Jesus himself said, come on, you can be my bride. You can rule and reign with me. You can sit with me in my throne. You can have a crown and a robe. And you can be my bride throughout eternity. You can own everything I own. You can be in my kingdom. You can rule and reign throughout eternity. What is wrong with someone's brain that says, mm, yeah, that's all right. I've got salvation. That's plenty. And that's exactly and precisely what is going on in this last day. 
I preached a three-part uh, series uh, last year or sometime uh, in the recent past on the blindness of the church. And we see very, very uh, plainly before us that there is a blindness that has descended upon the church and so if you're watching me online, you might want to look those up on the YouTube channel. But I want to just say this, that the reality that Jesus is coming has fallen on this church like a blanket in 2018. God has spoken to us and he said, there's one thing that you lack, just like the rich young ruler that came to Jesus. And he said, I've obeyed the Ten Commandments. I've done this. I've done that. I've obeyed the law. I've done everything that was on the list. Come on, somebody can hear what I'm saying. Uh, and, and I've done everything uh, that the pastor told me. Uh, I did this uh, X, Y, and Z, uh, and it's all checked off. Uh, and Jesus said, well, you still lack one thing. Uh, in his case, uh, he said, go sell everything that you have uh, and come back to me and we'll talk. Uh, but can I tell you uh, that the Spirit of God uh, has spoken to this church, uh, and, and as I begin to seek God and say, Lord, I've, I want to be ready. I want to help our people uh, that, that will hear the word of God to be ready. I want those who are seeking the face of God to be ready. He said, you still lack one thing. He said, you're going to have to learn how to let go. And so if you've been watching any of our messages or if you have been in the services, you know that 2018 for us is the year of letting go. That's what God has spoken to us. And as you have owned that and taken that home with you, some of you have begun to discover what that means for your life and discovered something very personal in that message that, that the Holy Ghost is challenging each and every one of us. It is not just some general proclamation over reconciling Pentecost Apostle Assembly uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, but it is a, a very uh, specific and a very personal uh, message uh, from the bridegroom to the bride-to-be. Uh, he said, there's just one thing uh, that you're going to have to wrap your brain around, uh, that you're going to have to learn to do, uh, and that is uh, you're going to have to let go uh, because the Word of God said uh, that when the midnight cry comes uh, and when that trumpet sounds, uh, that the dead in Christ uh, are going to rise first, uh, and then we which are alive and remain uh, are going to be caught up together to meet him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord the word says that in the moment in the twinkling of an eye we're going to be changed hallelujah and we're going to see him as he is and so can I tell you that you're going to have to learn to be ready before the moment in the twinkling of an eye Amen. So what does it mean? You see, we need to really, really put into practice what it is required of us. And so we're going to go into some scripture and we're going to look. I've been preaching a series, Letting Go. And today I'm going to preach a message entitled, Letting Go of the Many. Letting Go of the Many. Because you see, it's only few who are the chosen. It's the word of God. It can't be changed. Jesus said, heaven and earth are going to pass away, but my word will last forever. My word will not change. Come on. And so we need to wrap our brains around the fact of what it looks like. And so the first thing that I want to tell you in this year of letting go is that it's not just about letting go of your possessions. How many know you're not going to take your car with you when the trumpet sounds? How many know that your flat screen TV, your computer system, your, your, uh, you, you know, your, your DVR that is currently recording the Super Bowl is going to stay here should the trumpet sound. Before this service is over, you're going to have to let go of the Super Bowl. You're going to have to let go of all the fanfare. Come on, somebody's hearing what I'm saying. There is a letting go that is going to have to take place. You're not going to be able to own all the jewelry that you have acquired or the gifts that somebody that you love have given to you or any of the things, but you know it doesn't stop with your possessions. Your house that you've, you've spent a lifetime working toward owning. 
your vacation home or your boat or whatever the things are that we acquire. Did you know the Bible says that you are not defined, that a man's life is not defined by the things that he owns? And so the word of God said, if you seek first my kingdom, oh, listen, that has a meaning. That means that you're going to say, Lord, even the food that I eat, even the place that I live, even the clothes on my back, everything that I own and everything in this world, it's going to have to be subjugated to my desire, my desire to seek after Basilea, to seek after intimacy with the bridegroom. You see, he's coming back for a bride who's made herself ready. Now, we hear that all the time. But what does it mean? We talk about, we just, we just spent a month talking about holiness and making ourselves ready. The bride has prepared herself with holiness and separation to her bridegroom. But can I tell you something? It's not simply about that. A bride that's made herself ready is ready to let go of everybody else. Here's what the word says. It says that a man will leave his family. A woman will leave her family when it comes time to join into one flesh. Can I tell you, every single marriage that I have performed was a, a spiritual transformation, of, whether they realized it or not, of two human beings letting go of some things over here and some people. so that they could belong completely to the one that they desperately love and want to join their life. And they, they join their lives together, and the Word of God said these two will become one. And that's what marriage does. And so in counseling, every single one of you who have sat with me in counseling, you know that we go uh, to the Scriptures and, and we make it very plain. Your family is not involved in your marriage. Don't be sharing stuff that's intimate between you and your husband or wife with your family. It's none of their business. Your loyalty, it doesn't mean you don't love them. It doesn't mean you don't appreciate them. Come on, hear me today. It doesn't mean that you don't have a history. It doesn't mean that you don't love them with all of your heart. But when you step away and you say, oh, I want to be married. I want to be joined. I want to, to be one with this individual that can't happen unless you're willing to say I love you and you gave me life literally you literally gave mom dad you literally gave me life but now I'm going to have to step aside and, and, and you, you can't be in charge of me anymore because I belong just to my wife I belong just to my husband and here's what the Spirit of God is saying to his bride. He said, there's one thing that you lack. You're not ready to let go. You're not ready to let go. So I want to cover three different areas uh, of letting go of the many. Letting go of the many. This is a challenging series to preach because I, I don't, this is not warmed over leftovers, you know, that I heard 15 years ago. God is speaking like I've never heard him speak. And the anointing of God is upon his word to be revealed to you in a very special way. Hallelujah. It would be so easy just to go through. You know, I've got, I've got a binder, something like this. I mean, with, with all the sermon notes that I could just get into. And then I've got a database of the ones after, you know, I got, began doing it with the, the computer. I could literally pull from hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of messages that I've preached as an evangelist, as a pastor. Uh, and, you know, it would be very easy to pull some warmed over stuff. But you know what? God is speaking in such a way that I had the scriptures planned for Wednesday. Wednesday for the preaching that was going on on Wednesday tag team preaching uh, and I had those planned uh, and I had them written down and the Holy Ghost said put that down uh, that's not what I'm speaking uh, and so I had to I had to obey the Lord with something new something fresh and so I want you to hear this today because I promise uh, uh, that it is fresh it is fresh manna what happened to manna if they tried to use yesterday's batch you know what's really gross? It got worms in it. Worms in it, and it smelled, the Bible said. That's terrible. Is that what you're living on? Are you turning on the televangelist and living on stinking worms? 
I think Sister Jane got your attention. <laughs> Apparently this side needs to pay attention. Thank you, Sister Jane. Let me ask you again. Are you living on stinking worms and rotten manna? Be careful. They say you are what you eat. <laughs> oh, all right, I will go on. <laughs> and so I want to talk about three different uh, aspects of letting go of the many. This is not theoretical. The Bible says that many are called, few are chosen. And we're going to see that when we hear the trumpet sound, we're going to not only have to let go of these bodies. That's not going to be a challenge. <laughs> that's not going to be a challenge at all. I'm ready for my new changed, upgraded body. That's never going to feel pain again. Hallelujah. Never going to get tired again. Hallelujah. My God, I can't wait. So that's not going to be hard to let go of. But I want to focus today on letting go of the many so that I can belong to my bridegroom. Go with me to Revelation, the third chapter. And we're going to start at the 14th verse. This is very specifically written to the end time church by Jesus. Did you know that after the death, burial, resurrection, and the day of Pentecost, that John was uh, exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And guess what? Jesus Christ showed up bodily in front of him, in his glorified body. Showed up. And he said, here are some things that I want to show you. And this is going to be the ride of your life, John. <laughs> you're going to see some things that you're barely going to be able to find words to try to describe. And he stood in front of John and he said this. He said, I've got some messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor, which are the end time churches of me, Jesus Christ. And he said, I've got some letters that that I want you to dictate and this is one of them in the third chapter here's what he said he said there's a church that is called Laodicea and this letter needs to go to the pastor of the church of the Laodiceans and he said write this he said these things uh, saith the amen the faithful the true witness the beginning of the creation of God he said I know thy works I know thy works. The word of God tells us that salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. He was not going to speak to his end time church who was already Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. He was not interested in talking to them about salvation. But he did say, I know your works. And based on your works, this should sound familiar around here. I know your works. He said, you're neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. And because you're neither cold or hot, but you're lukewarm. He said, I'll spew thee out of my mouth because you say that I'm rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing. And you don't even know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. What does naked mean? You find out later in the chapter, later in the letter, he said, you're going to have to purchase the robe of righteousness. You're going to have to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Hallelujah. And so uh, this, this group of the end time church, he said, here's what I want you to understand. You're deceiving yourselves. You're blind. You're specifically blind. Look at this. He said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and he said you're gonna have to buy it it's not going to be just draped magically over you come on somebody that understands how holiness works he said you're gonna have to pay a price for it and he said that thou may be clothed and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear and look at this and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see why would he say that it's because Laodicea is blind Laodicea is blind. And so uh, I want to show you something because, uh, first of all, Laodicea in the Greek is very telling. It's, it's amazing. 
the specificity that Jesus used 2,000 years ago to speak of a church that exists today. Come on, hear what I'm saying today. And here's, I want to just break it down for you very quickly. Laodicea is uh, a contraction of two different Greek words, laos and decay. And it literally means this. Are you ready? Buckle up your seatbelts if you need to, uh, so that you, you know, your mind might just explode when you hear this, that Jesus 2000 years ago said, there's going to be a name for this church. Who's not hot. They're not cold. They're lukewarm and they're blind. And they think that they're all that, but really they're, they're wretched. They're blind. They're naked. And here's what he said. Laos and decay. It literally means this social justice. So what is he saying? He said, well, Church of Social Justice, you are substituting the things of the world for hearing the voice of the bridegroom in the last day. And so what am I saying? Am I saying that politics are evil and sinful? Not at all. I vote. I have an opinion, believe it or not, now and then. I, I, I don't have any problem with that. I am a red-blooded American, and I am thankful that God has allowed me to be a citizen in the greatest country that has ever existed on the face of the earth, the greatest Christian nation that ever has or ever will exist, and God let me be here. I'm grateful for it. But can I tell you that I'd better be ready to let go of the politics of this world when the bridegroom shows up. I better not be more of a Democrat than I am a bride of Christ. I better not be more of a liberal or or a conservative or, or a Republican than I am bought by the blood and washed by Jesus Christ himself. He owns me. And I wonder, those of you that watch MSNBC all day long or Fox all day long, I wonder if you're ready when the trumpet sounds uh, to lay down the church of social justice and say, no, I'm ready for my bridegroom. Let me share a little fun fact with you. When Jesus comes back, the second coming of Jesus, after the rapture, after we've been married with our bridegroom, hallelujah, after uh, the tribulation, when he comes back, you know what's going to happen? He is going to defeat his enemies. There's judgment coming to this world. And just as he destroyed the earth, and, and I looked it up just to make sure I was on track. You know why he destroyed the earth with the flood in Noah's day? It was because the world was wicked. And the world became violent. And he said, this is not what I created man to be. I'm going to have to start over. (laughs) I'm going to have to just destroy. And guess what? He said, I will never destroy this earth with, with a flood again. And so here's your rainbow to prove that. Oh, but I am coming back to destroy the earth one more time with fire. And I want to tell you that after he destroys this earth with fire, democracy will not exist anymore. Republicans won't exist anymore. Democrats won't exist anymore. Centrists won't exist anymore. You know what the government is going to be? Just as it says in Isaiah 9 and 6, the government shall be upon his shoulders and it shall never end. It shall never end. Guess what? If you're one of the elect who populates the earth as the rest of us rule and reign with Christ in our glorified bodies, it's not really going to matter whether you have an opinion. It's going to matter what Jesus says because he's going to be bodily in the new Jerusalem and the government is going to be upon his shoulders. (laughs) So here's what I want to say to a world who has immersed and a church who has immersed itself in politics, you better learn to let go if you want to go up when the trumpet sounds. And so Jesus said to the church of social justice, listen, there's nothing wrong with doing good. There's nothing wrong. And we're going to go to uh, James, a scripture in James, because I want to be very specific about religion. Now, be careful. Some of you that just got a little bit arrogant when you heard that word, religion. Because I guarantee somebody in this house would say, well, I'm just better than religion. I hate religion. Come on, you've heard the ridiculous, 
ignorant folks say that, and you're going to understand why I say that in just a second. Because James, the first chapter in the 26th verse, it says this, if any man among you seem to be religious, ooh, there you are, that attitude. If he seems to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but he deceives his own heart, and that man's religion is vain. All right? So if you can't keep your mouth shut, your religion is vain. Look at this. Pure religion and undefiled before God has a definition. And the father is this. It's to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. Wow, that sounds great. That's, you know, social justice. That's, that's wonderful. Let's just all, let's, let's go march in the streets and visit the fatherless and the widows. And let's raise money and let's pass uh, legislation and let's tax everybody and, and give it to the fatherless and the widows. Oh, okay. Good works are fine. Jesus never said do it through the legislation. Matter of fact, he said that it needs to come out of your pocket. Not you trying to get it out of someone else's pocket. Come on, hear me today. You're not doing anything for God in the kingdom of God by trying to leverage money out of somebody else's pocket. Open your own pocket if you want a blessing from God. It said, give, not make someone else give, and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Somebody get a revelation today. But I want you to watch the last part of this passage because we're defining pure religion. And certainly we are called to good works, but we have completely, and Laodicea has completely missed the boat when it came to the, for the, to the, the next part of this definition. It said, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Wow. Some of you are looking at me like you've never even heard that before. I promise I didn't just put that in there. So pure religion has a definition is to do good works, but it's also to keep yourself unspotted and holy from the world. Come on. And so here's my point here today, that we are going to have to be willing to let go of Laodicea. If you want to be in the bride of Christ, Laodicea is the lukewarm group that he said, I'm going to spew them out of my mouth into the tribulation. They're the ones that are not in love with me. They're not hot. They're not cold. They're just lukewarm. And he said, because they're lukewarm and if you know if you've ever driven and you get the heat a little bit too comfortable and you're a little bit sleepy that 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 lukewarm area in there it makes you go to sleep when you're hot you can't sleep when you're cold you can't sleep oh but it's that just little middle area that makes you go to sleep and so Jesus said you don't even see it you're asleep you don't know that you're blind and wretched and naked and and got all these problems he said it's not too late and I've come to tell my my social justice friends uh, that the door is still open Uh, seek the Lord uh, while he may be found Uh, separate uh, yourself from the things uh, of this world Uh, whether it's unholy living uh, whether it's unholy speaking and talking uh, and walking whether it's politics because I happen to know and have heard from many people and experienced it myself that sometimes you go to churches of our of our kind And there's nothing about Jesus Christ and his blood and the cross of Calvary. In fact, they have to take a break from the political commercials so that they can take an offering. And so I want to challenge somebody. I'm I'm speaking beyond the walls of this church today. And I I have very few friends already, so I really don't have much to lose at this point. Because the truth, it'll set you free, but it'll also set your friends free and they'll go somewhere else. It costs something to walk in truth. And so here's what I've come to tell you, that you've got to be willing to let go of Laodicea. You've got to be willing to let go of it. And it's not going to be easy for some. I've said this in joking, but it has begun to ring true. I love you, but I will leave you. I love you, but I will leave you. Because I can't seek the kingdom of God for you. Hallelujah. I know you're not running the aisles and swinging from the chandeliers today. 
But true religion requires holiness to the bridegroom. The second group that I want to talk about is found in Matthew, the 25th chapter. Let's look at the first verse, Matthew 25 and 1. This is a parable of the ten virgins who all want to be married to the bridegroom. All of them have kept themselves holy unto the bridegroom. And the spiritual visualization of being a virgin, Paul said that I have espoused you to one husband. And you need to keep yourself to that husband. And so the, the visualization is intact here that all of these folks had kept themselves separate so that that they could be in the bride and that they could uh, join with the bridegroom. Here's what the word said. Then shall the kingdom of heaven, Jesus speaking here, uh, he is uh, explaining the kingdom of heaven, Basilea. He said it's going to be like 10 virgins which took their lamps, went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. They, were, uh, they that were foolish took their lamps but they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. I want to explain this very quickly because I have taught on this and preached on this in the past. But the Bible is very clear. Psalm 119, 105 said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So Jesus was completely, uh, how many know that Jesus knew the word when he walked on earth? He was the word when he walked on earth. Amen. The living word incarnate. And so he knew that David had written that the, the word of God was a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So when he began to speak about the lamp, he was speaking about the word of God but then he began to speak of oil and that the oil needed to not just be in the lamp not just in the word which is already anointed but there had to be an additional amount of oil and that oil went somewhere else it had to be an additional purchased amount of oil that went into the vessel the word of God said this in Corinthians it said know ye not that your body is the temple of of the Holy Ghost and I've come to tell somebody you are the vessel of the anointing of God Jesus said that there's going to be power that falls upon you when the Holy Ghost comes you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you and then you'll be witnesses so what is Jesus teaching here about Basilea he's saying not only do you need the word but you need to be saturated with an oil that is not the oil of, of simple being filled with the Holy Ghost because we know that that's free but it's an oil and an anointing that will cost you and it's not, it's not oil that you can put in the lamp. It's oil that you need to have in your vessel. Hallelujah. Let's go on. Verse 5 says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, somebody say at midnight. There came a cry. Uh, a cry was made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out <laughs> to meet him. For all my friends that are expecting just to sit tight to, and in dominionism and, and the, the, you know, all, the, all that stuff, the manifest word of God doctrine where you just think you're going to stay on this earth and Jesus is going to just come right to you. No, 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 no. The, the wise virgins went out to meet him. <laughs> the bridegroom came and the cry was made and they said, okay, it's time to go out to, to meet him. And the Bible said that they went through a door. Amen. Amen. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil. Why? Because our lamps went out. That means that their lamps already had some oil, but they did not purchase the extra additional oil of anointing in their vessels. It takes an additional amount of purchased oil of anointing to receive the revelations of the word of God that the spirit of God is speaking in this last day. And they said, our lamps have gone out. Give us your oil. But look at this. The wise answered and said, not so lest there be not enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and that they that were ready went in with the marriage, uh, with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. 
afterward, after they decided, okay, we'll pay the price for the oil. After they decided, maybe there's something to these revelations. Maybe there's something to Basilea. Maybe there's something to that group of crazy people that are hearing from God and preaching things that we've never heard before. Maybe we ought to begin to pay attention afterward. Somebody say afterward. Came also the other virgin saying, where is everybody? Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, verily, I say unto you, I know you not. I know you not. Now, I want to just bring something to you very quickly here that perhaps you've never considered before. The bridegroom said to the foolish virgins, I don't know you, so I'm not going to open the door to you. But understand this, the foolish and the wise virgins, before they parted ways, they were all together. So how is it that if they were all in one group, come on, somebody understands that the body of Christ is the whole church, uh, but the bride of Christ is deep within the body. Just as Eve came out of the body of Adam, the bride is coming out of the body of Christ. <laughs> and so, but they were all together in that preliminary time when they were preparing to be with the bridegroom. Are you with me today? So how is it that the wise virgins came to know him, but the foolish virgins didn't know him? How's that possible? Well, they all had the lamps with them. And the word says this in John, the first chapter, in the beginning was the word. And the word was God and the word was with God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So I want you to understand something. They all had access to the word. They all had access, but it was the ones that said, no, I'm going to be saturated in my vessel with the anointing. And I'm not just going to carry the lamp, but I'm going to be saturated with an anointing to, to be intimate with the bridegroom. You see, they all had access to the lamps, but it was only half of them that said, I'll pay the price. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I'll pay the price because I want to know him. Paul said, oh, that I may know him, not just in the, the, the power of his resurrection, but in the fellowship of his suffering. You know, it's going to cost you something to know him. And so I want to bring this to you today. And then we're going to wrap this up shortly. I want you to understand something today, that the wise virgins, they had traveled and journeyed with the foolish. They had prepared, they had stood side by side. As a matter of fact, until it was found out that some of them didn't have the extra oil, I would submit to you that they couldn't tell each other apart. You can't look at somebody else and know what's going on inside of them. But there came a time when the wise had to say, no, you can't have my oil. It's cost too much, and I must be ready. And so, my dear friend, my dear sister, I'm going to have to let go of you, and, and perhaps there's time for you to go and purchase whatever that is. Purchase the salve for your eyes so that you can open your blinded eyes. Purchase the, the gold tried in the fire. Purchase the white robe of righteousness. Perhaps it's not too late. Oh, but listen, I'm going to have to let go of you because any moment... Any any second, I'm waiting for that sound. I'm waiting for that cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. You're not more important to me than he is. I love you. You mean a lot to me. Oh, but I'm going to have to let go. I'm going to have to leave you behind. I can't seek the master for you. I can't love him for you. I can't know him for you. You have to seek it out for yourself. There's a price that you have to pay. You have to give your Yourself to, completely to the bridegroom uh, if you really want to be ready. Uh, many are called, uh, oh, but only few uh, are going to be chosen uh, to rule and reign with Christ throughout eternity. 
Look at verse 25, Matthew 25 and 25. It says this. It says, I was afraid. This is the very next parable that Jesus talks about. And I'm going to go very, very quickly through it. This is a parable of the talents. But I want to focus on this one thing. Because, you see, uh, uh, Jesus spoke to the one servant that was given the fewest amount of talents. He was given one talent. And you know what he did? He buried the talent. Then when the master came back, and you know what he said to the other two, even though they were given different amounts, they were told, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. But here's what Jesus said to the one who hid the talent. He said this, uh, he said, what were you doing? And the servant said, well, I was afraid. I was afraid. Listen, the enemy has tried to attack the bride-to-be with fear. With fear. But I want to help you understand something. That's not going to protect you when the master comes back. He's not going to say, oh, you poor baby, you were afraid. No. What did you do with your talent? What did you, what did you do? I gave you a ministry. I gave you a life. I gave you a vapor of an existence to get ready and to train and to be prepared to turn yourself into someone who would seek my face, who would pay the price, who would let go of the world, who would come out from among them and make a decision to be separate unto me and to be married to me, to let go of your loved ones, to let go of your friends, to let go even of your church family and say, no, if you're not willing to pay the price, I still love you. I still I'm going to pray for you. Oh, but I love my bridegroom more. And so he said, I was afraid. So I hid the talent. I was afraid that I couldn't succeed. You gave me a gift to use for you. And I was afraid. So I just hid it. Well, pastor hadn't called me to sing for a while. Pastor hadn't called on me to preach for a while. Pastor hadn't asked me to teach for a while, so I'm just going to bury it. I've been too lazy to get up in the middle of the night and, 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 and go into intercession for somebody, so I'm just going to bury that and let everybody carry the load beside me for a while. He said I was afraid, so I went and hid the uh, talent in the earth. Notice it says, thy talent. The servant, even the wicked servant, knew that, that that gift wasn't really his. It was a loner to be used for the master and his kingdom. Look at this. He said, I, I hid thy talent in, in the earth. Lo, here it is. Here it is. I didn't lose anything. Here it is. Here, I'll give it back to you. His Lord answered and said unto him, you're wicked and you're lazy. You're wicked. And you're lazy. Slothful means lazy. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to put it out there. And look what happened to him. He said, take that talent and give it to him which hath ten talents. For unto him that hath, uh, look at this, shall be given. And he that hath not, it's going to be taken away. And look at this, cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I want to make very clear that this is not the lake of fire. This is not eternal punishment. What it is, is a servant who was given an opportunity. Somebody that was in the service of the king who was given an opportunity. And they squandered it because of fear and laziness. He said, you're a foolish servant. That ought to ring true because he called the virgins foolish virgins. You had just as much opportunity as everyone else. Come on, hear me today.
Jesus is speaking in this day and hour. Listen, somebody, somebody thinks that it's just, you know, Jesus is a big old mean God because he's not going to give everybody the... No, 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 no. He's not a socialist. He's not going to give you the same reward as somebody that's working. He said to Laodicea, I know your works. And because of your works, what you've done, what you haven't done, here are the consequences. Here are the rewards or here's the separation. To the foolish servant, Brother Nate, would you come? To the foolish servant, he said this, because you were lazy because you were wicked because you were uh, fearful you're not going to rule and reign with me I'm going to cast you into outer darkness it literally means somebody not ruling with him because when Jesus rules in the new Jerusalem it is the city where the lamb is the light the Bible said that there's not going to have to be a sun to light the day because the sun is going to be Jesus Christ in the city where the lamb is the light Hallelujah. Cast this unprofitable servant into outer darkness. Are you ready to let go of the foolish, the fearful, and the lazy that are right next to you in the body of Christ? The fearful, the wicked, the foolish, and the lazy. Are you ready to let go of them? Because the profitable servants walked through the door into the joy of the Lord. And the unprofitable went into outer darkness. One more passage of scripture, Matthew 7 and 21. I've spoken to you today about letting go of Laodicea. I've spoken to you about letting go of the foolish, the fearful, the lazy, and the wicked. And I want to bring one more group to you today, Matthew 7, 21. Jesus put it this way. He said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into Basilea to rule and reign with me. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many are called, but few are chosen. Well, look what the many are going to say. They're going to say, Lord, Lord, what are you talking about? We're in outer darkness. We were the ones who prophesied in the name of Jesus. We cast out devils in the name of Jesus. In your name. We did all these wonderful works. In fact, we, we put them on TV so the whole world could see and celebrate us. Look at me, I'm a healer. No, Jesus is the healer. I don't even have time to go into that. But here's what he says. He said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. You never purchased the extra oil so that you could receive the revelations in the word. And I am the living word incarnate. Are you seeing the connection today, church? We have the lamp in our hand, but do you have the extra oil of anointing to see the revelation that's all through his word? He said, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I'm going to liken him to a wise man. Are you seeing the pattern? He said, there's a foolish group and there's a wise group. And so today, he said, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. In the Greek, that word iniquity means workers of of willful ignorance workers of willful ignorance the wise virgins are going to have to get ourselves ready to let go of the willfully ignorant it breaks my heart I'll just be honest with you it breaks my heart and God never said that the husband and the wife aren't going to shed a few tears when they're saying goodbye to mama that raised him, and sister and brother and daddy that raised him. When they're saying goodbye, now I'm going to go and move out of your house. I'll probably see you, but I'm not going to see you like I used to see you. I'm getting married. I'm getting married. Come on. We've got some mothers that have probably shed a few tears in this place when you had to let go of your daughter, your son. But the fact of the matter is, if you want to be married, we're going to have to get ready to let go of some folks that are precious to us. 
you can't want the kingdom of God for somebody else. You can't seek the kingdom of God for somebody else. And listen, I didn't come to preach a funeral today. The fact of the matter is somebody's got to populate the new heaven and the new earth. Somebody's got to be ruled and reigned over. There's, there's some folks that are seeking God, the few that are seeking God that are going to be the bride of Christ that are going to rule and reign. Well, who did you think you were going to rule over? We can still rejoice with our brothers and sisters in their salvation. We can still rejoice that they prophesy and cast out devils and that they, that they know God, that they are filled with the Holy Ghost. But can I tell you something? God has spoken. Last generation, there was a transformational revelation that has caused this church to come into existence. Forty years ago, there was a transformational revelation on the face of Christianity. But Laodicea and the willful ignorant missed it. They missed it. They said, well, I, I see these churches that are coming up and I see these crazy homosexual people that think that they can serve God. And I see these transgender people that think that they can go to heaven, but they're all out of their minds and they've read the books. They probably have skimmed the books because whenever I've tried to reach out, they've already got a made up mind. And so there's a willful ignorance. Come on, hear me today. If I'm not talking to you in this church, it's perfectly fine. I know somebody is hearing me beyond the walls of this church. Willful ignorance is not just ignoring things that you, you, you really are uncomfortable with. Uh, or, or it is doing that. Willful ignorance is about hearing uh, the things from individuals and not hearing from God willful ignorance you see the word of God said buy the truth and sell it not it didn't say just hold your hands out and I'm just give you revelation after revelation no it will cost you it will cost you now I'm I'm done and bored with reconciliation I'm done and bored with reconciliation now I'm all about behold the bridegroom cometh but you see I had to receive what God gave me back then so that I could be where I am today are you hearing what I'm saying I had to say Lord Lord, I, it goes against everything I think I know. And Lord, I have to let go of, of all my traditional friends and family. Way back then I had to let go because they didn't have any place for me once I received the revelation of reconciliation. But God said, come on, come on. I, I'm calling you. And if you really want to be where I've called you to be, you're going to have to let go of those who are walking in willful ignorance. Willful ignorance. And so I let go. It broke my heart. There are family members who still to this day, they love God, but they won't uh, hardly speak to me because they're afraid. Ooh, it's just going to rub off. It's going to rub off. <laughs> icky, icky. It's going to rub off on them. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm afraid. Seeking God I can't rub off on anybody else. You have to determine in your heart, I don't care what this world holds. I don't care what tradition holds. I don't care what my former pastors and my family, what they do with their lives. I'm going to serve the bridegroom with every ounce of my energy. If he calls, I'm going to answer him. If he speaks, I'm going to say, Lord, I want to receive revelation. I want to have the extra oil to see what you're revealing in this day, in this hour. I'm tired of the box of doctrines that my denomination told me that's all there was. No, you didn't stop speaking. I want to hear what you have to say. Stand with me today, church.